Now, tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. All of you with your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. And 1 Corinthians comes right before 2 Corinthians, if you have any difficulty finding it. How many have your Bibles? Lift them up. Hold them. Wonderful. Thousands of people with Bibles. The first chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the 17th verse. And tonight, I want to speak on the subject, the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross. For Christ sent me, Paul is speaking, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. Paul said in my preaching that if I did it with cleverness and the wisdom of words, then would the cross lose its effect. He said for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. In other words, Paul said that a sermon like I'm going to preach to you tonight is foolish to you that are perishing. It is a foolish subject. It will be a foolish message. The apostles said that 1900 years ago. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Look at the world's wisdom today. Where is it? Our best brains are trying to build bigger and better bombs, more effective missiles, and engines of destruction Frankenstein monsters that can destroy civilization. All of our vaunted intellectualism, all of our vaunted culture and society and civilization, the scripture says God has made it foolish. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God has chosen this method to save men from destruction and judgment and hell. This method of preaching, this method of proclaiming the gospel, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot come to Christ except you hear the gospel. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jew a stumbling block, and unto the Gentile foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. This cross, this preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the scripture says, is wiser than all the men of all the ages. Wiser than all the university professors wiser than all the intellectuals. It's foolish to the world, but God says this very foolishness is wiser than this world. And the weakness of God, the weakness of God, the cross, seems to be to the world a weakness. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and things which are despised. Think of it. Base things. The cross was a base thing. It was a thing to be despised. It was called a scandal among men. And yet God chose that method to confound the wise and to save the world. That no flesh should glory in his presence. No man will ever be able to stand in heaven and say, I got here by my own ability, by my own works. We will have to stand and say when we get to heaven, we got here by the cross. We got here by the death of Christ on the cross. 
and the fact that he was raised again from the dead. And Isaiah had said 800 years before, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. And in Galatians, the apostle said, And I, brethren, if I yet preach works unto you, then is the offense of the cross ceased. The apostle Paul said in all of his preaching, in all of his proclaiming of the gospel, there is an offense to the cross. Paul said, I can preach anything else, and there's no offense. But when you preach the cross, there is an offense. And this expression, the offense of the cross, sounds strange to our modern ears. Because you see, we have a beautiful cross on our churches. We have crosses in the lapels of our coats. We have crosses around our necks. We have crosses embossed on our Bibles. We never think of it as a scandal and as an offense. And yet the Bible says it's a stumbling block. It's an offense, it's a scandal among men. It's a base and despised thing. It is an old rugged cross. It was a place to execute criminals. It was a place where the vilest died. And when I see Christ hanging on the cross, I say with Isaiah, there is no beauty that I should desire him. Paul says, that in his day there was an offense and I found in my own ministry that I can preach anything else and it's called popular. It pleases the ear. But when I come to the heart of Christianity, when I come to the cross and the blood and the resurrection, that is the stumbling block. That's the thing people do not want to hear. That's the thing that is foolish. That's the thing that is an offense. And yet it's that very thing that is the heart of the gospel. And without the cross, there is no salvation. There is no forgiveness. God said, I'll meet the human race only one place. That is the cross. And if you haven't been to the cross, there is no salvation and there is no forgiveness. Why is the cross an offense? I got to thinking about this not long ago. Why the cross is an offense? I see Christ hanging on the tree. I see him dying for me. I see blood being shed. I see nails in his hands. I see a spike in his feet. And I see Christ dying for sin, an offense. Why is it an offense? First, the cross is an offense because it is the condemnation of the world. The cross says to the world, you're a sinner. The cross said to the thief who was dying on the other cross, you're a sinner, you better repent. And the thief did repent. He confessed his sins and he said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Christ forgave him right there. But first, the cross condemned his sins and made him confess and acknowledge that he was a sinner to the centurion who had helped nail him there. The cross said to the centurion, you're a sinner. And the centurion had to exclaim, surely this must have been the son of God. The cross said to Herod, you're an immoral man. You're living in adultery. And the cross speaks to you about your sins tonight, your sins of immorality. There is no sin in the Bible that the Bible condemns more than the sin of immorality. It is America's great sin tonight. It is the same sin that caused the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is the same sin that caused fire and brimstone to be rained down on the two cities of the plain. It is a sin that God hates. And God said, Whosoever looketh upon a person of the opposite sex to lust has committed it already. And the cross said to Herod, You're living in immorality and you're going to go to hell for that unless you repent of sin. And Herod didn't like it. And Herod rebelled. He cringed under the impact of the cross, which became a conscience to Herod and spoke to Herod. And tonight some of you are cringing because you know that that is your sin. Look at another man, Caiaphas. Proud, cold, crafty, 
wise old man in his pride. And the cross said to Caiaphas, you're a sinner, Caiaphas. You're a religious leader, but you're a sinner. Jesus had said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And I tell you, I don't care if you are a Sunday school teacher, if you are a deacon or an elder, or a church leader, unless there has come a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, it means nothing. We have a lot of religiosity in this country. We have a great deal of religion in America. We have a great deal of worship in America that is not true worship. The Pharisees fasted twice a week. They paid tithes. They were orthodox. They were fundamental. They believed the scriptures from cover to cover. And yet Jesus, in the most scathing language, denounced them and indicated they were not saved and indicated they would come to him in the last day and he would say, depart from me, you cursed. I never knew you. Caiaphas was a religious leader and yet he helped crucify Jesus. Pride. And there is no pride in all the world as terrible as religious pride. Proud of our religion. Proud of the things we do, the externals of religion, when down inside we are filled with pride and jealousy and envy and backbiting and gossiping. And we do not lack, we do not have love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, in that we love one another. Do we love? By their fruits ye shall know them. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And if I see a person who isn't loving his brother in Christ, I have a right to doubt whether that man has ever been to the cross, no matter who he is or how much he may say he believes, because the Bible says the devils believe. Oh, the devils are orthodox. They believe and tremble. But they're not saved. Look at Pilate. The cross said to Pilate, you're a coward, Pilate. Filled with your fear and cowardness. Pilate, you're a sinner. And Pilate didn't like it. He cringed and tried to run from the Savior. Look at Judas. The cross says to Judas, Judas, you're covetous. And covetousness is idolatry. Judas was with Jesus for three years. He had heard all the sermons that Jesus had preached. In fact, Judas had baptized. Judas had been on Jesus' team had traveled for three years with Christ, had been one of his intimate companions. And yet Judas was lost. Judas was covetous all the time. Judas was lost in the end because he had never realized the personal, intimate presence of Christ and he had never understood nor been to the cross in by faith and had an encounter with Christ that counts. And it's possible to be in the organization that Christ founded. It's possible to be in all the religious organizations. And if Judas, who spent three years traveling with Jesus, was lost, that should cause all of us to search our hearts to see how we stand. The soldiers that gambled for his garment. The cross to all of these people says you're a sinner. And when Paul preached the cross before Governor Felix, Felix trembled and said, when I have a more convenient season, I will call for you. Felix tried to get away. Why? Festus said to Paul when he preached the cross to him, he said, you're mad, Paul. Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to become a Christian. And the cross has come down through the centuries passing its unfaltering judgment upon the vanities, prides, hates, greeds, and self-indulgent pleasures and lusts of men. The cross says to us all, you're a sinner. It becomes the conscience of the world. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when I come to the foot of the cross, the first thing I have to say is, I am a sinner. But the scripture says, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. You don't want the light of the cross. And so the cross becomes a stumbling block.
it becomes foolish to. When you realize that you must give up your sins, when you realize that you must acknowledge that you're a sinner, you say no, no, and you cringe, and you go back into your darkness, and the light of the cross begins to penetrate into your extortion, into your pride, into your idolatry, into your bigotry, into your intolerance, into all the sins of your life, the cross sends a beam of light and you cringe back and say, no, no, no. Don't expose me. And the cross goes down into the dark recesses of your heart where even your wife or husband cannot go. Even your family cannot go. Even your best friend cannot go. Down deep inside of you and sees the sins and exposes them to the light. And God says someday that every secret thing shall be brought out. And the cross says, you're a sinner in need of repentance. And so the cross becomes a stumbling block. And it's an offense to all of us that are sinners tonight because we don't like to be told we're sinners and we don't like to acknowledge that we've broken God's law. You see, we're all proud. We don't like to come to an old cross where blood is being shed and saying, oh God, I'm a sinner, forgive me. We don't like to do that because we have to come in humility. One of the reasons I ask people to come forward in these crusades is not only an expression of their will, but it is also an expression of humility. Jesus could have healed the man with the withered arm by saying, be healed, but he didn't do it. Jesus said, stretch it forth. He wanted the man to do something. And the man stretched it forth, an act of his will, and the man was healed. When I ask people to come forward in a crusade, I'm asking them to do something, to express their will, to say, I will receive Christ. I will follow him. I will serve him. I will come to the cross and acknowledge that I'm a sinner and turn from my sins. And then secondly, the cross of Jesus Christ is an offense because blood was shed there. We hear a great deal about the slaughterhouse religion, religion of blood. And some people don't like it. And it becomes an offense. But the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And the Bible says eight things about the blood of Jesus Christ. First, the Bible says it is the blood of propitiation. Romans 3.25 when, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the forgiveness of sins that are past. The word propitiation means mercy seat. It is the meeting place. It is where God covers our sins. And I tell you, your sins will never be covered except by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Secondly, it is the blood of redemption. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. We are bought back by the blood of Christ. We were not bought with silver and gold and precious stones. God paid the price of the blood of his only son who died on the cross for our redemption. He could have given one of his planets. Scientists tell us that he's got billions of them. He could have given a planet. He could have given all the oil, all gold, and all the silver, and all the world, because it's all his. But he didn't do it. He gave and shed the blood of his only son on the cross. And it becomes an offense because of the blood but it's the only place that you can meet God. It's the only way you'll ever have forgiveness. If you want forgiveness of your sins and you want to go to heaven, you have to come by the way of the blood. And then thirdly, it is the blood of remission. Hebrews 9, 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. The scripture says without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. How can you get around that? You'll have to tear out half the Bible if you tear the blood out of the Bible. It's there. And it teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It is the blood of reconciliation. 
Ephesians 2.13, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In other words, our sins have separated between us and God, and the scripture says, Be ye reconciled to God. How can I get back to God? There's an empty place in your life. Down deep inside of you, there's a sense of not belonging, of incompleteness. And you've been searching for joy and peace and happiness. You'll never find that fulfillment. You'll never find that completeness apart from the person of Jesus Christ and apart from God's fellowship. Because you see, you were made in the image of God, made for fellowship with God. And without God, there is no joy and peace deep down in your soul. And the only way that you can be reconciled to God, the scripture says, is by the blood that was shed on that cross. It is also the blood of justification. Romans 5, 9. Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Justified. Justification means a lot more than forgiveness. Forgiveness is not enough. I must be justified just as if I had never sinned. Just as though I had never committed one sin. God wipes out the past. He forgets my sins. He puts my sins in the depths of the sea. How and why? Justified, the scripture says in Romans, by his blood. Then it is the blood of peace. Colossians 1.20. We have peace through the blood of his cross. Peace. You've been searching for peace, haven't you? You want joy and peace in your heart? You want peace with God, peace with your neighbors, and peace down inside? Everywhere you've searched, you've gone to the psychiatrist. You've read all the books that you could find that had the title Peace. All right, I'm going to tell you how you can get peace. And I don't believe there's any permanent peace outside of this. You can get peace at the cross and only there. And then seventhly, it is the blood of entrance. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. We come into the presence of God, and when I come into God's presence, I don't come up as the Pharisee and say, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are. Lord, I preach to crowds of people. Lord, I'm a fairly good man. I try to be decent. I try to tell the truth. I try to treat my neighbors myself. I try to do all of these things. And Lord, I deserve to be in heaven. No! He would reject me when I stand at the judgment in that day. I shall plead only one thing. The fact that one day by faith I went to the cross and gave my life to Jesus and had my sins cleansed by his blood. That is my only claim to heaven. I don't claim to be going to heaven today because I have preached or because I'm a good man. I claim to be going to heaven only on the merit and the ground of Jesus and his death at the cross. And then it is the blood that cleanses 1 John 1, 6, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Martin Luther was once reminded by the devil of his many sins, and he tabulated them. Is that all, asked Luther? No, there are many, many more, sneered Satan, and added many more. Is that all? Yes, and now what, said the devil? Now, said Martin Luther, right beneath them all. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth from all sin. J.P. Morgan's will contained 10,000 words. He made many transactions, and some of them affected the entire financial equilibrium of the world. Here is what J.P. Morgan put in his will to his children. Listen. I commit my soul into the hands of my Savior, full of confidence, that having redeemed me and washed me with his most precious blood, he will present me faultless before the throne of my heavenly Father. I entreat my children to maintain and defend at all hazard and at all cost of personal sacrifice the blessed doctrine of complete atonement of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ once offered and through that alone. J.P. Morgan was right, and J.P. Morgan is in heaven tonight, not because... He was a great financier, not because he was a great philanthropist, but because he was trusting in the atonement of Jesus Christ. You say, well, what does the blood mean? The Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. The word blood 
means the life, the life of Christ. The life of Jesus Christ given on the cross. The word blood is symbolic in the Bible of life. He gave his life. He emptied himself for us on the cross. He took our sins by emptying himself, by taking our suffering and our sin and our hell. There is much mystery to the cross. There are many things about the cross that I don't understand, but this one thing I know, it is the way of salvation. And I'm to come by faith, even though it may seem foolish and irrational, and it may not seem the right thing to do, and people may laugh at it, yet God says he has chosen the preaching of the cross to bring men to himself. And then thirdly, the cross of Christ is an offense because it sets forth an imperative ideal of life. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ demands that when you come to the cross, that you take up a cross. And we don't like that. That is an offense. That is a stumbling block. It is not a matter of just coming to the cross one time or two times or ten times. It is a matter of leaving the cross, but sharing Christ's rejection, taking up your own cross that we must do. Christ demands that we live a life of self-crucifixion, and many chafe at the restraint of a life like Christ. We refuse to give up what we know the cross condemns. And in a city like San Francisco or New York or Philadelphia or Washington, many of you watching that, to take up your cross would mean that you would become burdened about the poverty-stricken people in the slum areas of your community. That would become your cross. It might not be popular to take a stand on a moral issue. It means that you take your stand against intolerance and bigotry. It means that you take your stand on social issues in your community that may not be popular. That's not easy to do. That's cross-bearing. It means that you go back to the campus. You're a student. You go back to the campus. Not many real pe people living for Christ on the campus. It means that you go and take your stand for Jesus Christ even if they sneer and laugh and mock and ridicule. It means that you share the rejection of Jesus Christ. It means that you as a businessman go back to your business and put into your business Christian principles no matter what it may cost you financially. That's what it means. And Jesus said, unless you're willing to take up the cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Are you willing to take up the cross? It means that you're going to have to forgive your husband or your wife whom you've been quarreling with. It means you're going to have to forgive that man that did something against you. It means that you're going to start out in a whole new realm of life. That is the crucifixion Christ is talking about. That is the cross. Are you willing to bear it? Oh, it'll mean opposition. In fact, Jesus listed several types of opposition. He said, first, there will be civic opposition. They will deliver you up before the councils. He said, there may be national opposition. Ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. There may even be ecclesiastical opposition because he said they will scourge you in their churches. And when Lord Shaftesbury tried to get through a bill to ease the working conditions of the laboring people in England, and to end the child labor law or to end child labor in England that was crushing the youth of England. Almost every bishop in the church opposed him. But he stood his ground and won the battle. And every bishop in 1958 would agree that Shaftesbury was right. It cost him something. And in 1861, when they were talking about ending slavery, one of the major denominations of this country said, it is the church's duty to preserve slavery. And those that were against slavery were crucified, even within the church. 
It also may mean domestic opposition. Jesus said, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. There may be people in your own house that will not understand. They'll think you've gone crazy. They'll be ready to take you to the psychiatrist if you really give your life to Christ. Because you see, Christ will be so foreign to them when you start reading your Bible and praying and going to church. It may mean opposition within your own household, but you must take your stand. It is cross-bearing. Do it courteously and graciously and kind and lovingly, but take your stand. And then it may mean opposition in general. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, the scripture says. And I want to tell you, persecution is painful. It's not an easy death. It's not an easy suffering. And the Christian life is not easy. Don't let anybody tell you that it's easy and a bed of roses. It is not. The scripture does teach, Jesus said, my yoke is light. And thanks be unto God, there is joy and peace in the midst of persecution. There is joy and peace in the midst of crucifixion. There is joy and peace when the nails are going in the hands. But there may be suffering in living for Jesus, and you must be willing to face it. That's the cost of discipleship. Are you ready to take up your cross? And then lastly, the cross of Christ is an offense because it claims to be the power of God unto salvation. And it makes this claim without an alternative. You see, the world would like to say that there are many roads to heaven and somehow we'll all get there eventually. But Jesus in the scripture says, no, there's only one. Just one. And that is by the road of the cross. And God said, I will not meet you any other place except the cross. We say, now, Lord, I'd like to meet you some other place on some other ground. God says, no. Suppose I had an appointment or asked for an appointment with the president or he asked for an appointment with me and gave me the time. And I wrote back and said, no, uh, that's not very convenient, Mr. President. I don't think I can make it. I'll, I'll do no, I would write back and say, why, well, certainly it'll be convenient. God says, I want an appointment with you. I want to forgive your sins. I want to change your life. I want to make you a new person. But God sets the conditions. And Jesus said the way to heaven is very narrow. Jesus was broad-minded in many ways. But in other ways, he was narrow, and he said, it is a narrow gate that leads to heaven, and at the entrance to that gate is a cross, and to the world it is an offense. We don't like the cross, but I tell you, there is no alternative. It demands from every man is his first duty to get right with God. And we can talk about ritualism and works and all the rest, and the offense of the cross will cease. I found in my preaching I can touch on any other subject. It's popular, but not the cross. It's an offense. It's a scandal. The world stumbles over it, and that is the very reason why thousands are not in the kingdom of God tonight and thousands are not truly Christian tonight. Because they've never been to the cross. And once you've been to the cross and had the experience of his forgiveness and had an encounter with the Christ of the cross, you're never the same. But I would not like to close this message tonight leaving you to think that Christ stayed on the cross. He didn't. They took him down from the cross. They put him in a tomb. He stayed there three days and three nights. And on the third morning, Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went out to anoint a dead body. He wasn't there. And the angel was there, and the angel gave the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He is risen. And tonight, I do not offer you people in the cow palace a dead Christ. I offer a risen Savior. A triumphant Savior, a Savior that is living at the right hand of God the Father, a Savior whose presence is here tonight. But he says, before you can come to me in victory, before you can be raised, before you can have the triumph and the joy and the crown, there must first be the cross. 
I ask you tonight, have you been to the cross? Are you sure of it? You say, well, Billy, how do you go to the cross? There are two ways. One way, but there are two implications. First, you must be willing to repent of your sin. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. That means that you acknowledge you're a sinner. And when you come to the cross in coming, you're acknowledging that. And you must be willing to renounce your sins. It means that you change your view about God. You change your view about Christ, yourself, and your neighbor. It means a change is ready to take place in your life. That change is called repentance. Then you must be willing by faith to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and take your stand with him at the cross. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you know why many people today do not have the power to live a good life? They want to be good. They want to do the right thing, but they don't find any power within them. I'll tell you why. They've never been to the cross, because when you come to the cross and share the rejection of Christ and share Christ at the cross, then you become crucified with Christ, never again to live. Yet not you, but Christ liveth in you and through you to give you a new power, a new dynamic, and a new dimension to life. The joy and the peace that he brings to the soul. He gives you that sense of fulfillment and complete. And he can be yours tonight, right tonight. You say, well, how long would that take, Billy? That quick, just like that, you can receive Christ. Now, that's only the beginning. That doesn't mean you become perfect. But it does mean that you've changed your way of living. You've changed the direction of your life. You're coming to the cross. You're giving your life to him, and the cross becomes the beginning of a new and thrilling and glorious life. Even though it's an offense, this foolishness, this offense, this scandal of God that is called the cross becomes glorious and planned in the mind of the Trinity becomes the entrance to a new and glorious and thrilling existence that will last for eternity and you become the partaker of eternal life. And then you have the power to live the Christian principles and live with the Sermon on the Mount. He gives you a new power. It's all yours tonight. And it's free because Christ paid for it on the cross. I'm going to ask all of you to receive him tonight. And I want to tell you there's a danger in putting it off because you can only come to Christ when God speaks to you. And tonight he's speaking to many of you and this is your moment and your night to give your life to him. And if you don't tonight, you may never. The Bible says, he that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Don't you presume on the mercy of God. He died for you on the cross. He shed his blood. He loved you so much and he loved me so much that he was willing to die. But don't presume on that. I'm going to ask you to come right now. Just get up out of your seat everywhere and stand right here. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. And if you're a member of the church, you want to come and receive him and renew that vow that first you took. If you're not a member of any church, you're coming to receive him for the first time. You come right now, quickly. Just get up out of your seat all over the building and say, tonight I want to give my life to Christ. And I'm going to ask every head is bowed, every eye is closed, nobody looking. And the choir is going to sing softly just as I am. And hundreds of you come, men, women, young people, boys and girls. You may be in a delegation. They'll wait on you. After you've all come, we're going to have a moment of prayer and a verse of scripture. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. You just come right now. And stand quietly here saying, by standing here, I give my life to Christ. That's it, quickly, from everywhere. You just come.
That's it. Just come on. There are many people streaming down every aisle here. Hundreds of people here in the car palace. And there are many of you sitting in your living room at home. You'd like to be here and come down this aisle and stand here and give your life to Christ. You can right where you are. Right now, you can say quietly inside, Lord Jesus, come in. I am a sinner and I need you. You may be in some nightclub and the television set is on. You may be in a bar. You may be in the home of a friend. Bow your head and give your life to Christ now. Then go to church tomorrow. Tell your minister what you've done. Tell him you want in the church. You want to take your stand with Christ, no matter what it costs. Get a Bible and start reading it. Spend a little while in prayer each day. Witness for Christ by living for him. Then, if you do make a decision for Christ, write and tell us about it. Write me here in San Francisco, and I'll send you the same literature that we're going to give to these many people that have come tonight. Will you do that? God bless you.